everybody. I'm David with Ball Over Live, and I'm here with Chandra with Aaron and Franklin, but she also sits on the board of TWIA. And as many of you know from our show last week, uh, TWIA had a meeting Tuesday morning that lasted all morning and a little bit after lunch, if I'm not mistaken. But one of the big things the TWIA board was going to do was vote on a 10% uh, rate increase. And Chandra, it didn't turn out as we planned, did it? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, it did, the board uh, did vote. It was a six to three vote and they did vote to accept the 10% rate indication, you know, increase that was uh, given to us by our actuarial and underwriting committee. Uh, the three people that did not support that were uh, all the coastal representatives who were myself, George Neblet and Peggy Gonzalez. Um, all the rest of the board members did support that 10% increase. Okay, um, but there's a but, button here. Yeah, but- There's um, so still time. There's still time, right. So we had a really great outpouring of public uh, support. We had public comment. There was over 1,500 people online that had submitted public comment. There were probably, I think we had 30 speakers that spoke during the, the morning. Uh, against it. There was only, I believe, one person that spoke in favor of it. Uh, so we did have quite a lot of uh, public comment that uh, was against this rate increase, uh, including Senator Megas Middleton, Terry Leo Wilson. Um, there was a Brazoria representative and one down from the Valley. So, and of course, Todd Hunter. So we had, we had some good legislative representation there as well that were speaking against this. Um, but the next thing is, is that commissioner has to approve it. So uh, we do have the opportunity for the commissioner to either flat out say no or reduce it. Uh, she does have the ability to do that, um, but that's completely in her purview. So, you know, I would recommend those 1500 people or more need to get with their legislators and put pressure on them to talk to the commissioner um, to not make that happen. Even if she does approve it or some form of rate increase, it still has to go, you know, the governor could still shoot it down. That right. happened about five years ago. So um, so there's still a couple of avenues to keep it from going into effect. But um, right now, the way it stands, that was the board's, um, what the board adopted. And that's what they're planning on happening starting in January on new policy. Okay, let's talk about, because before we went on air, we were talking about Burl and how much uh, you thought you were going to be using. And there's actually a good point in this on that was brought up during this event uh, or this yeah. vote. So, so one of the biggest costs right now for us is reinsurance. And part of that is um, that's the very top, top tier of our funding structure. And so we, once we set what we call the PML, the probable maximum loss for what we feel like we would have in a storm season, um, we, we set that based on statute and they give us, I mean, a little guidance, but not enough guidance. So we have to decide every year, what does that number look like? And this year was 6.5 billion. And that's what we feel like we would need to cover a major storm event on the coast. Uh, and be solvent. And so we have our funding structure that takes care of that. And whatever that gap is in the top between the funding that's already preordained, what's in our bank account, which is the CRTF, and then that reinsurance, we have to buy that. Right. Well, that number, I mean, you know, if you buy more reinsurance, then that premium goes up. And then we, they look at our risk, you know, you know, have we had storms, have we had claims? And then of course, what kind of money we have? Well, we're about to exhaust that money. We're about to exhaust everything in our piggy bank to pay for barrel, which which is good. So at least we're not moving into our funding structure. So we don't have to take out loans. We don't have to assess the companies. But you know the funding structure hasn't changed in a long time. It's 500 million in each little tranche there. And that hasn't changed in a long time. Those tranches have not gone up. Um, really, I feel like those funding should be flipped if it should be assessments first, then us taking loans, because if we take a loan, we're going to have to pay it back. And right wow. now with interest rates, it's really, really high for us to pay those bags. I mean, back a long time ago, the last time we took bonds, I want to say it was like eight and a half percent. Now it's going to be probably over 10% to pay, pay those bonds back. So, uh, hopefully we don't have any storms this year that would require us to take out bonds. Um, but if we do, just know that we're going to pay those back, and they're going to they're going to want another rate increase. 
Yeah. You know, when you and I were talking, we were talking about Burl. And I said, well, you know, it didn't come into a major metropolitan area. It was down more in a, not a isolated, but less homes. It was different than if it would have hit Galveston or come on to Bolivar. And Galveston actually had some damage down on the West End. Um, if it would have been moved 25 miles east, East, it right. It's been a whole different ball game right. because it would have come right through Galveston, sort of like Ike, up through the ship channel, affected us, Galveston, Kima, right. and all that area in there, and then gone on up into Bay City and all that. Um, what are the estimates? And I'm saying this mm -hmm. just so that people can realize what the costs are now because right. you know, building costs and repair costs have gone way, way up, probably up. 50 to 60 percent i would think since i yeah a couple of couple of things a lot of the damages that we're seeing i mean while they were significant they a lot of them weren't over deductible so the, the, the people have changed their deductibles because it's so expensive to have the policy right. they've moved to that five percent deductible which you know on a uh two hundred thousand dollar house is ten thousand dollars well i mean that's a regroup right there so right. I mean, you're 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 not looking at um you're not looking at really being able to file a claim and get anything back, you know? So right now there's about 26, a little over 26,000 claims that have been put in for barrel. Um, the current estimates are that we're going to pretty much exhaust our catastrophe reserve fund. Right now it's $451 million and it's, they're looking at it to be about like 440 is what they're thinking. So we'll have maybe a little bit left in there, but not much. Yeah, and so there's more to taxing, I mean, the rate increase than than just, hey, we're just going to go up and pat our pockets because you're really right. not patting anyone's pocket because it's not a, a, a company company as far right. as someone making money. This is we're not, just, Yeah, we're not profiting, profiting yeah. or anything. Yeah, yeah so this is just covering, covering expenses yeah anything that we have extra like every year anything we have extra uh from paying by the time we pay our claims and we take our policy premium anything we have extra we put in that catastrophe reserve fund and you know had we not been doing that the last seven years since harvey uh we would have nothing right we would have nothing in the bank and so now today we have money to pay claims for barrel which is great but if anything else happens between now and the end of hurricane season um we'll have to move into our funding structure. We'll have to take out loans. We'll have to, you know, if it goes to the next level, we'll have to take out assessments against the member uh, companies, which is all the, the big companies, the state farms, all state farmers, all the, everybody that's, in, you know, that's writing policies in Texas will have to pay their part uh, based on the book of business that they write. So um, it's, it's a big, you know, I mean, it's a big concern that we get through this hurricane season the rest of the time without anything going on. Otherwise, it's going to really Affect. dip into that. Yeah, dip into that funding structure. What's the estimates? If y'all raise it 10%, how's that going to help you? How much is that going to raise y'all's uh, fund, so funds or anything? Yeah, so that was one of the points that I had made. So they had given us, when they did the actual and underwriting committee meeting, they gave us this chart. And the chart showed like, what our actual adequacy that they had estimated versus whether or not we took a rate increase. And we could kind of see what those trends look like. And so when you look at the time period after Ike to about Harvey, they had taken like 5% like every year. They, they call it a glide path model where they just kind mm -hmm. of gradually, you know, increase the premium over time. And that's kind of was their model. Um, but you really didn't see an impact on those actuarial numbers coming down. And so the cost has point, gone up so much. Right. So you get to the point where now, you know, they we haven't taken really a rate increase for like in about four or five years. I mean we took one and we had several other rate votes, but they didn't go into effect. So uh, once the commissioner got rid of it, once the governor got rid of it. So we we've had a few other times where they tried to do that and it didn't, you know, it it, it didn't go into effect. But just even looking at those numbers, you know, we really are still hovering at about the same place that we were when we were taking 5% a year. Right. So, um, so that was my point. It's like, okay, we're, whether we take 5% or whether we do nothing or we take 10%, it's not moving the scale. It's not moving the needle. You know, we're not becoming more adequate 
by taking these increases. Although um, because of barrel, what this will do is allow us to put more money in the bank so that we'll have a little bit there. More you know, reserve. Yeah, a little bit more reserve, exactly. Well, when this goes from, uh, has two more steps it has to go through, when will we know, is it gonna be 10% as they requested? Is it gonna be 5%? Right. You know, when will this finalize? So we're required to file this by August 15th. So uh, August 15th, you know, is the day that we have to file our board recommendation to the uh, commissioner's office. And I don't know how long she has to review it. Um, I want to say it's October 15th. So she has a little bit of time to review it. But I would say start putting pressure now. If you don't like this outcome, uh, start putting pressure now on your legislators and say, hey, y'all need to talk to the commissioner's office. Y'all need to talk to the governor's office. Y'all need to try to set this aside. Make a commitment to change the funding structure. Make a commitment to uh, share this expense with you know twia's other member company you know other member companies in you know in the market uh even if they're not writing wind because that's part of the problem is that everybody just stepped out of the market and said we're not going to write wind we're only going to write auto we're only going to write this and they write all these policies they write homeowners policies they write everything else and they won't write wind and they're going to dump that on twia yeah. but then they don't want to take any responsibility when something happens so they want to have all the benefit and none of the risks so you know we're we have to put some of that back on the member companies to take some of this risk, whether that's through assessments. For example, the other sister company of TWIA is Fair Plan. Okay, Fair Plan does not have this funding structure. Fair Plan has a fully, they have an assessment funding structure. So when they are out of money, they assess the member companies. Right. And and that would be a better funding structure for TWIA. If we just, if we just mirrored what they were doing in Fair Plan, which is uh, tier two, you know, tier two counties, so Harris County and all that, you know, tier in, um, there, that would be better than what we have right now as TWIA. So we've got to really, really, they, Mays did a really good job last year trying to get some legislation through, you know, we know how the Texas legislature works. It, you can't get anything through the first time. You've got to, it's got to go through right. the iterations and you got to work on it a little bit. So hopefully when he picks that up this year, which he seemed to be dedicated to doing that yesterday, um, I feel like, you know, we can maybe make some really good progress with that legislation moving forward because he was very passionate about, about this. And hopefully that can be one of his, you know, missions to, you know, get that and move it forward. I know Mays has, has really been posting a lot through social media, talking about it and talking about getting letters sent in and stuff. And he does amazing work. I know he's helped us down here on Bolivar um, and really everyone, uh, he really goes out of his way. And I, I'm anxious to see how he approaches it and what he's gonna do because, uh, you know, he was already uh, against the rate increase and stuff. Right. And, you know, you and I talked last week about what what we thought would happen, and it didn't happen that way. But there's still a couple more steps. And so, if if you're in the the counties, uh, the other thing, real quick, we were talking earlier, and you said out of all the coastal counties during Burl, and I'm, I want people to know how much Burl actually hit Texas. There were only, I think, three counties, if I'm not mistaken, that didn't have claims um, from yeah. Hurricane Burl. Yeah, they gave us a, a, a re, kind of a recap of Burl yesterday, um, and they gave us a breakdown of claims per, per county. And there was like only three or four that had no claims. Everybody else had That's some right. amount of claim. Uh, you know, and of course, some areas more concentrated than others. Right. But you know, there's and there's a lot of people, like I was saying earlier, that that aren't going to meet their deductible and they're like, eh, I'm not going to file a claim. What's the point? You know? Yeah. So, so there's probably a lot of people more than that that have damage that just haven't. Filed but because claim. they've yeah. raised their, in order to save money, they've raised their, uh, uh, my tongue tied. Their deductible. deductible. Yeah. And right. so they may not have claims. In fact, I talked yeah. to someone yesterday that said, you know, I was going to go out cause I've been do shooting drone photos of roofs. And they said, well, by the time we do the claim and our deductible, 
there's really not any difference there. And so we right. need, we're going to have to go ahead and pay for it or it'll be better for us just to pay for it. Yeah, because if you file a claim, then they're going to raise your, your yep. premium anyway. Um, and that's that's exactly that's exactly what happens. Um, I know that when uh, when people are making that decision about do I do I change my deductible? One of the other big changes, you know, and this happens every year, and so you really have to think about what your needs are, mm -hmm. um, because every year those policies are adjusted based on the value of the property. So if you had a property that's worth $200,000 and then next year it's going to be worth 220, well, they're going to automatically up right. it to 220 and they're going to add, you know, premium to cover 220, not 200. So, um, and they're going to look at replacement value, not just like appraised value. So you right. have to really decide, you know, what kind of policy do I want? And, Part of that's having a relationship with the agents and and understanding you know what you're getting but a lot of people end up just saying oh well just decrease that deductible or increase the deductible because i can't afford right. the increase plus the premium hike on right. you know that so it's a compounding problem yeah yeah well i'm anxious to see and we'll keep everyone updated um as we get more news We'll try and do shows on it, letting you know where things are going down here. Uh, I know from myself and, and, you know, Chandra, you're on the board. You're also in the engineering. You're in the coastal region, too. And so, you know, it affects yeah. everyone down here. And it's just, you know, costs keep going up. And then we had the stock market that went to heck the other day. Right. And so, you know, it's not looking good. We need to get everything on the narrow at least we weren't florida and the east coast yeah. um, because they're fighting an, a mixture of burl and harvey put to and imelda put together because of the flooding they're having yeah. and so i want to send out our prayers to everyone from florida all the way up the east coast i think at this recording it's around uh georgia and up through uh South carolina, carolina sure, yeah. so yeah. um anyway but well, we'll be back with more information on this as it happens, let you know exactly what's going on with the rate increase for TWIA uh, this year or next year, I should say. So, Chandra, thanks for joining us this morning. Until next time, I'm David with Bolivar Live. Y'all have a great day, great week. Come see us. God bless and bye-bye.